Kitchener Knight, you can feel the aura rising in the room, which means that we're about to start. So very good evening to everyone and welcome to this special event in a special series of events. The special series of events is, of course, the uh, lecture series in Chinese Buddhism, generally sponsored by the Robert N. H. Hope Foundation. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor really for helping us, the Center of Buddhist Studies at Source, to step up this very, very interesting and successful series of lectures. Normally we have three double events each year. So there is a uh, lecture on a Friday <coughs> evening followed by a seminar on the following Saturday morning. And normally we tend to balance between uh, three main areas. So the history of art, and the history and doctrines of Buddhism, and, and uh, in particular the contemporary. So this year, for example, we're having uh, Stefania Travagnin in January talking about uh, modern and contemporary Buddhism in China, and we're going to have James Robson from Harvard, I think, in May. So, so much for the special series of events, but of course we have a particularly special event tonight. And it's special because this is the inaugural lecture uh, this year, and because we have a special guest, right? very famous and popular, and, uh, and a host privilege by honor myself. So, Professor Lothar Lindy Rose is with us this evening. Uh, to talk about, I think, something that goes well beyond uh, Buddhism and has a lot to say also about Chinese history. Uh, professor Lederer is a senior professor in the history of East Asian art at the University of Heidelberg. And uh, I think it is fair to say that uh, it would take perhaps as long as the whole lecture's lot to go through his publications and interests and everything. Uh, before I came to this room, we were just discussing actually my very first acquaintance with his work. It goes back when I was a graduate student and was writing my degree thesis on something related to medieval Taoism, and actually it was uh, something that he published on Tumba in the 1980s about uh, calligraphy and Taoism under the 16th century. But then, of course, this is just one corner of this manifold interest, which of course do embrace calligraphy as a form of art, do embrace a lot of China and Japan, and uh, among his seminal publications, certainly I should mention <coughs> in his 2000 book, 10,000 Things, on the very idea of the modular concept, which I think was uh, an eye-opening in many respects uh, about the way that not only Chinese art, but many things in the Chinese culture actually work. And I think it was because of that they were given a Balzan Prize in well, Italy. Well, and actually, I just discovered uh, uh, this evening uh, that uh, you've got uh, Wikipedia pages in English, which is fair enough, right? In German, fair enough. In Chinese, you would expect it, but in Italian. And now you see there is a sort of uh, special connection between these cultures, and I think that's why you were given the special prize in connection to that book. Um, so we're talking about China and Japan, so East Asia, we're talking about calligraphy, we're got, talking about the history of art, uh, and then we're talking about Buddhism, which perhaps is slightly late come, but not a recent addition to your uh, impressive field of expertise. And uh, I think that uh, the things that Lota is going to talk to us about uh, uh, today and tomorrow are related to the long-term project on, you know, Buddhist epigraphy and uh, rock carved sutras in a number of locations in China, in particular in uh, uh, Sichuan, in Shandong, then later there will be something from Shanxi. And the first ongoing project of this has been, of course, a series of publications, seven volumes so far, on Buddhist stone sutras in China. So I think in Chinese, Zhongguo Fu Jiao Shi Jing, something like that, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And now we have reached seven fully published uh, volumes, but I think eight and nine, uh, very soon. 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 Yes, soon. Not very and, soon. And what soon. I really like about this man, that actually we are talking about a project stretching into 2028. <laughs> so it needs a monumental man to work on such a monumental scale. <laughs> so without further ado, let's Lord, yeah. take the floor and talk about China writing yeah. differently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonello, for this very kind and nice introduction. I hope we will all meet again in 2028. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm, I'll just start right away and um, show you this first slide. This is Mount, a mountain in North America. And uh, from 1927 to 1941. The, can you still hear me when I walk around? Yeah. The, the sculptors uh, Gottsen Borklum and his son Lincoln 
they carved the colossal portraits of the American presidents. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, it's uh, here. George Washington, Jefferson, and um, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and of course Abraham Lincoln. And you see, this is the place for President Trump. He, <laughs> <laughs> he, you, you can already see his hair. His hair. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, through these figures, the formerly very remote, incon inconspicuous and unknown mountain in South Dakota, in the middle <coughs> of the North American continent, became a visible and tangible symbol of political power and of the rock-solid foundation and everlasting power of the American nation. Now, about 1,200 years earlier, we see this uh, in 730 in Sichuan. Many of you will have been there. And there, Buddhist monks <coughs> began to carve this colossal statue uh, of the Buddha Maitreya into the rock. And this mountain was also transformed by this statue, and it became a symbol, not, not only a symbol of religious, Buddhist religious power, but also a source of this religious power. The Buddha is present here. He is present and he can be physically experienced and he can be venerated and worshipped from, by people who here, down here, and his religious power emanates from this figure. Now we come to the, this remote part of Shandong and uh, in Shandong province and we also find Buddhist Buddhas, Buddhas carved into the rock. But those are not represented in human form or as icons, but they are represented by written characters. And actually this is the barren part of Shandong we t were talking about before. And nobody goes there. It's, it's hard to imagine that you find these stretches in the middle of bustling China, but uh, here you find inscriptions carved into stone and they were discovered by a shepherd. The shepherd who goes with his sheep around every day and they eat the little grass which they still can find. And this shepherd discovered uh, the Buddhist inscription, and then one was this here, Da Kung Wangfo. At the time, it, it didn't have the white color, of course. It just just engraved, and the shepherd discovered this. The Buddha <coughs> of the great, uh, or let's say the great Buddha, king of emptiness. But I mean, <laughs> you have to instruct me. Is it the great? Buddha or the great emptiness or is it the great king? Anyway, the Buddha king of great emptiness. Let's leave it like that. <coughs> and this uh, is on a mountain called Hongdingshan <coughs> and it's, these characters are more than nine meters high. This line this is nine meters high and the largest character Da here measures from here to here 3.4 meters. I mean, pretty large. Uh, here we are climbing the, I'm <laughs> not very venerable, <laughs> but if this is our Chinese friend, Mr. Wan, who takes a rubbing of the inscription. And of course, in rubbings, you can see much clearer than on the rock what the inscription looks like. <coughs> Although uh, this is something we learned in, during our research on the f in the field that even rubbings are not necessarily all reliable. I mean, uh, no, that is, one thinks of rubbings are uh, reliable, they are prints, but they are not. For example, whether this is really looks like this, like a hand, it's hard to know, it's hard to know. And we have, uh, <coughs> we have examples of the same inscription with two different rubbings. If, if you c put them side by side, it's amazing, they look, they are just different. The people rub out what they think there is. I mean, mostly, of course, they do the right thing, but there are border cases. 
Now, <coughs> this, there is another one, Da uh, Shan Yen Fo, the Buddha uh, of Great Mountain Cliff. Da Shan Yen Fo, the Buddha of the Great Mountain Cliff, nearby. And the, originally, this one also looked like this, so it's hard to find. I mean, it needs a shepherd with, <laughs> with eyes to find such things. Uh, this, uh, these two names now are very interesting. They are not in the canon. We know that there are thousands, more than 10,000 Buddha names in the Buddhist canon, but these two names are not. They are local Buddhas. They are local Buddhas. And by engraving their names into this rock, they are conjured up from the depths of the cosmos, and they're brought to, into existence here in our world, and they made to reside in this mountain. So both, uh, I hope, it's true, but <laughs> we can talk about it. Both um, engravings uh, date from the 560s AD. Just, just a short discretion, let us for a moment think how these engravings got there. It's not easy. For here the, you see the detail with this da and you see the traces of the brush movement hewn into stone. It's hard to imagine a calligrapher standing there and, and wielding this brush and especially the 3.4 meters long stroke. I mean, how, how do you do this when, when it's, it's pretty steep? Actually, this is still steeper than the Dakong Wangfo where you saw the photo of Mr. Wan taking the rubbing. So uh, possibly they could have built a scaffolding and somebody would have swept this, but even that is hard to imagine because you need scaffolding almost for each character. So, do you have an idea what the solution, one possible solution could be? <laughs> one possible solution would be this. You have somebody writing huge characters on the floor. And this is uh, the c famous calligrapher Wang Dongling who wrote this just a month ago in Hangzhou. And uh, I mean, this is a practice, a general practice to write on the floor with a huge brush. And one could imagine that somebody wrote these <coughs> Da Chan Yen Fo characters on the floor and maybe probably not on paper but on a cloth. And the cloth would then be put onto the rock in the, because the cloth adapts to the uneven surface of the rock and then through the cloth you could engrave the characters. That's one possibility. <coughs> I have uh, talked about this with several, I mean, often with Chinese specialists, and there is no unanimous uh, idea how it was done. But I mean, to me, this looks quite plausible. Now, come back to the Buddhist uh, issues. This is a Chinese lady praying below three icons of a Buddha, of Buddhas, of three Buddhas. And these icons face the lady on high pedestals in the back of a liturgic room on the central axis of this room. And the interesting thing is that in Christianity we find very similar situations like this. This is in Altötting near Munich, a sort of pilgrimage site. And it's, I, it seems to me quite comparable also in the central axis in the elevated uh, icon of the Virgin. Even the gold and uh, red color scheme sort of evokes the sacred atmosphere, both comparis comparable. But this you will not find in Europe. This is a lady praying in front of a character, not a statue of the Buddha, but in front of the character Buddha. And uh, 
This means, and uh, here I'm coming to the center of my talk, actually, or one of the centers, that uh, the relation between the written word and the, and the thing that it points to is different in China. I mean, in China, this character has, takes part of the essence of the Buddha. It, is, it, is, it can be venerated. I mean, you can pray in front of a character. You couldn't do this in, in the West. I mean, you'd never find a similar situation where you have the word Christ, let's say, printed and people praying in front of this. <coughs> so that means the relation between signifier and signified is completely different in the log logographic Chinese script. Uh, Chinese characters are visually and physically, they partake in the essence of what they signify. You may have read or remember Michel Foucault, he begins his big book, Les Mots et les Choses of 1966, by recalling this, uh, his own chattering laughter together with his friend after seeing the astounding taxonomy of animals in what he calls a certain Chinese encyclopedia. And the seemingly meaningless categories lead him into the central theme of his book, which is the relation between words and things. But even half a century ago, this French intellectual should have known better. In China, the relation between les mots et les choses is simply different from that in the West. <coughs> now, another issue, uh, coming to another issue, is the iconography of death. The iconography of death of the founder of the religion. Perhaps the most fundamental difference between men and animals, or one of the most fundamental differences, is that from childhood on, we know that we will die. And oversimplifying, we might say that much, if not even all, or anyway, very much of what we call culture springs from that awareness. And helping us in coming to terms with, with death. And again, I'm oversimplifying is one of the main functions of religion. The cross, the most ubiquitous symbol in Christianity, and, uh, and very everywhere you see it, is a simple and simple reminder of death. When we see a cross, we are reminded that someday we will die. <coughs> This now is the iconographically most explicit oh, representation of a cross. Grunewald's Isenheimer altarpiece of completed around 1515. Now in Buddhist art too, we have an iconography of the religious founder, an iconography of the Buddha's death. And this colossal more figure, more than 20 meters long, in Sichuan, in the grove of the reclining Buddha, Wo Fo Yuan, in Anye County, shows the Buddha in the moment of death. But whereas Grunewald presents Christ's vulnerable, mortal, suffering body, the, this Buddha's body is lying quietly and covered by a well-pleated garment and his face is serene. Yet both iconographies, both iconographies uh, convey this similar message, or the same message actually, that death will be overcome. Christ, Christ's body will be resurrected and ascend to paradise. And as we know, the Buddha is not simply dying, but he is entering nirvana. And nirvana is the sphere of ultimate bliss. 
Now, <coughs> several of the large Buddhist compounds in Asia center on this scene, the colossal Buddha uh, statue. Uh, uh, well, not this scene, but on a colossal Buddha statue. I mean, think of this ba Bamiyan, you know, which was blown up by the Taliban in 2001. Uh, and in East Asia, uh, on the these statues show the Buddha standing like here or sitting. Um, we saw the Buddha in Lershan in the very beginning, standing Buddha figure. Or they sit in meditation like here in Kamakura, dated 1248, <coughs> but colossal statues of the reclining Buddha are more common in South and Southeast Asia. In East Asia, that in Wofoyan, in Sichuan is almost an exception. I mean, there, there are other examples. Uh, often they are in the rear of liturgical caves. But <coughs> the the statue of the reclining Buddha, which I just saw, which you just saw in Sichuan, is uh, by being there turns this valley into a replica, a replica of the site in a, in India, Kushinagara, where the Buddha entered Nirvana. But it is more than a replica. What makes this? Uh, what makes this statue or this grove actually in Sichuan into more than a replica of Kushinagara is the fact that the giant tech, uh, statue on the one side of the valley is matched by a giant quantity of texts. This is the valley which with the uh, giant figure, the giant figure is to the left, it would be here somewhere and across the valley, you, with these rice fields here, you can imagine there are this is this southern escarpment, and into these rock walls are engraved caves, and caves have been carved out of the rocky cliff, and I show the aerial view. This is here. The Buddha is lying here, which we just saw, and the caves are marked here by little squares, <coughs> and uh, the yellow caves are those which contain sutra, engraved sutras, and the blue caves uh, do not contain sutras. They have either sculptures or they have not been finished at all, or even left empty. And to the right here, if you go up here to the right, there is another part of this valley here uh, and beyond this lake you have more caves here, all a row of caves. Altogether there are about 120 caves. But here only one cave one, 109 and 110 are filled with engraved sutras. And to get there you need to go by boat and uh, then you'll, you'll have to climb up somewhere here in, in, up to these caves. Now, uh, I'll show you some of the caves. They are here, some of the caves, and uh, there are more caves here. There are four caves. Uh, the, for the get into the upper ones, of course, you need a ladder. And these caves are cube-shaped. They're like cubicles, cube, simple cubes, and they have a reveal around the entrance. And uh, now let's look into one of those caves. Oh, no, yeah, this is the scaffolding for the caves 109 and 1010. And you, you see these caves up here. And the people, the locals, nicely, very nicely and expertly built this ca scaffolding for us to uh, climb up into these caves. This is a view into one of those caves. And uh, they are just simple boxes, box-shaped. And this is the engraving. You see the engraving. One, one wall is 
It's a little bit more than 2 by 2 meters, 220 by 220 meters, and it contains about 10,000 characters. And 10,000 characters is the average of one scroll. I mean, average, it, of course, it varies a lot, but so you have one scroll uh, carved into the wall, and this is a detail of one of these walls. You see how the characters are engraved. They are about 2 by 2 centimeters, 4 square centimeters each character. Now, uh, it was planned, we can extrapolate this from various, by various means. It was planned to engrave a total of two million characters in the grove. But uh, not, they were not finished and so, but anyway, the most conspicuous and the largest text is the Nirvana Sutra. And the Nirvana Sutra has more than 300,000 characters. And its focus is the Buddha's death, and it sort of complements the Nirvana Sutra, complements the uh, colossal statue on the northern wall. Now, our work, we have been there since 2010, and we have not quite finished, but we're coming close to an end. We uh, record all the characters on the walls that are still extant. Now, if you look at this, the Buddha, the Buddha, or the, rather the body, the body of the Buddha is present in this grove in two forms. In two forms. One is the iconic colossal figure, and the other is the iconic, an iconic, not iconic script in these written sermons, in his, in his sermons. And maybe I should explain this a bit more. Uh, in Christianity, we have, <coughs> uh, to compare again with Christianity, we have an intricate and theological discussion, many deliberations, that deal with the multiple forms of the body of Christ, the Corpus Christi. There is a mortal body, of Christ, seen in Grunewald's altarpiece, but there is also the transfigured body in Grunewald's ascension scene, and then the body of Christ, as you know, is present in the Last Supper, and even the church itself may call itself, may, call, may be called Corpus Christi. In Buddhism, too, the Buddha, the body of the Buddha is the topic of, many, of a manifold discourse, there is a historic Buddha in Shakyamuni in India, and, but this is only one possible form of the Buddha's body, or was one possible form in our age. And this is just another out of countless examples of representations of the Buddha's body. 830 in the Japanese temple Jingoji, it shows a Buddha in meditation pose, and here we cannot say what time this is, at which moment he is shown, and we cannot say where he sits. It is, he is beyond time and space, this body of the Buddha. And in this sense, it can be compared to the transfigured body of Christ, which we saw. So the body of Christ manifests itself in various ways, as I just said, but never in script. But the Buddha, the body of the Buddha does this. In his written Buddha, sutras, he manifests himself. And this can be demonstrated easily with the, by relics in the pagoda, as you probably know, or certainly know. I mean, relics... Uh, or let's say a pagoda is the tomb of the body of the Buddha, the tomb of the Buddha, and this is why every pagoda should contain relics from his body. Like again in Christianity, relics of saints are deposited in the altar of every Christian church. And in Buddhism <coughs> Uh, they, they, the Buddhists don't use the relics of 
saints, but they use the relics of the Buddha, whereas Christians use, cannot use the relics of the Christ because Christ went up into heaven, so they have to use relics of saints. But uh, there is, of course, a problem that y there are not enough relics. Uh, this is the pagoda of Farmensu. Roderick knows this in and out. He has written about this a lot. And uh, it was built in the 9th century. And there inside in, in the crypt were discovered this seven nested caskets with relics. And in the smallest casket here, there was a bone relic of the Buddha in, in here. Now, uh, the innermost casket contained the bone relic in the crypt under the pagoda. Now, this, these are some of the one million pagodas, uh, miniature pagodas, which the Japanese Empress Koken Tenno had made from 764 to 770. And actually, I just saw today in the wonderful Buddhist exhibition in the British Library one of these uh, pagodas. They were given to the British Library. Uh, now, what did the Japanese Empress do? I mean, she could never dream of getting one million bone fragments from the Buddha to put into those pagodas, but the pagodas needed relics to be efficacious. So what she did is she inserted into the pagoda the printed texts with the Buddha's words. And you, you see these uh, small sutra, printed sutra, uh, actually also an amazing feat, the earliest printed sutras in, in, um, in Japan, one million prints. And these sutras are also the Buddha, the, the body of the Buddha. Now, uh, in Sichuan, in the grove of the reclining Buddha, which we saw, uh, the relics are not in pagodas, but in the caves, as we saw, these cube-shaped cube, cube uh, caves. But these caves have also are also related to uh, relic caskets. I mean, <coughs> Jessica Rosen, who's sitting here, has written a brilliant article in one of our volumes about one of these uh, cubical caves. It's the only one which has a ornament on the walls and where the sutra fields are in encased by these ornaments. And she has shown that by with these ornaments and their arrangement, this cave is actually likened to a to a sutra cave, sutra casket, where you have the sutras in in a casket. So the caves are in Wofuyuan are one could say sutra caskets. And when you go into the cave, you are in a sutra casket. And there is another similarity uh, to tombs. Uh, this, these are Han Dynasty tombs in Sichuan, and they, they, you go in there, they, uh, they also have these reveals. They are in a cliff, a rock cliff, and it can be compared to these caves in Wofuyuan, which we saw, I mean, also like, similar, and they have these reveals. And what is similar, similar in terms of function is that in the, these caves, these are tombs, and you keep the body of the deceased, the body of, of the people have, uh, in the family who have deceased, have, have gone, and you can <coughs> later enter, still enter this tomb. You can enter and you could, can put in new bodies or you can venerate the bodies, but maybe we don't know about the uh, lit liturgy which was performed there, but there certainly there was some, some literature in, liturgy in these uh, tombs. And the same is uh, true for the caves in Wofuyuan. Here, not the mortal Buddha, and not the mortal body is preserved, but the body of the Buddha is preserved. And you can also go in there 
and do veneration. We don't know. Unfortunately, we have no idea what really happened in these caves, but anyway, they were accessible. And in these caves, then the Buddha, uh, the Buddha's body is still preserved even after his mortal body has left this world. So there is this unique combination in the grave of the uh, uh, in, in, in Wolfgang, the grove of the reclining Buddha. It, it has on the one hand the statue of the Buddha, which uh, um, is a, makes the grove, as we said, into a, turns it into a replica of the Indian Kushinagara. But in addition, and this is the unique Chinese edition, it doesn't exist in India, uh, come these uh, engraved characters. And so together, the, Buddha, the statue of the Buddha and the engraved uh, sutras, they turn the grove into a compelling testament of overcoming death. It is one of the great monuments of Buddhist art in Asia. <coughs> now I come to a third point. And that is the political role of Buddhism uh, and the role of writing in politics. As we know, around 100 AD, two large empires existed on the Eurasian continent, the Roman Empire and the Empire of the Han Dynasty. And they were quite comparable uh, in size. They have show a map where, where they are superimposed. The two emperors are superimposed. I mean, you get an idea that they are of roughly comparable size. And they were also comparable in population. People think they both comprised about 60 million people. And more um, comparisons concern the emperor. There was one emperor and a lean administration and a net of highways as well as a common language which uh, guaranteed c cultural and political uh, coherence. And both empires built, uh, I mean, used large infantry armies to protect their empires from assaults from outside, from inner Asia. And for this purpose, they built these walls, as we know. I mean, the famous Great Wall in the Limes here, or Hadrian Wall up here near Scotland, and uh, quite comparable. But both in both empires, the walls did not prevent the, that the peoples from Inner Asia prevailed. And in both cases, it was one reason that in the third and fourth centuries, the empires broke up into two parts. The Roman Empire in the West and Eastern Roman Empire and the China in the Northern and Southern dynasties. Now, pe many people have written about the comparison and compared to Rome and uh, Han or Han Chinese Empire, but I have, maybe I haven't read enough, but I have not found so much about the fact that, which is another parallel, that this breakup of the two empires was uh, accompanied by the invasion and expansion of a new religion. Here, Christianity and there, Buddhism. And both world religions were not tied to one political territory and both had sacred scriptures in several languages, such as Hebrew, Greek, and Latin here, or Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, Chinese, and others on the other side. And both creeds were radically metaphysical, if I'm not sure we can use that word, but we can talk about it. Anyway, they, they, their followers yearned for a world beyond, beyond ours, and our world to them was a veil of tears. <coughs> Obviously, to the people of the time, the breakup of the empires appeared as a calamity. 
which needed to be healed. And in both cases, the big question was whether the new religion could play a constructive role in this process of coming together again. And different answers were given. In Rome, Nero, Emperor Nero persecuted the Christians down into the catacombs, but in 313, Constantine gained victory in the sign of the cross. And in China, where the north had in the meantime split into two parts, the northern Zhou dynasty in the west and the northern Qi dynasty yellow in the east, the situation was similar. Under the northern Qi, which lasted from 550 to 579, Buddhism flourished <coughs> as never before on Chinese soul, soil. Uh, some 30,000 monasteries, large and small, are reported to have existed, populated by about 3 million monks and nuns, about 10% of the entire population. And they created fantastic rock engravings of Buddhist sutra texts under the open sky, such as the two Buddha inscriptions, which we saw in the very beginning, I mean, the Dakung Wangfo and Dashan Yenfo, and many more. And this, the largest of the inscription is this one, the Diamond Sutra on Mount Tai, which we are going to discuss in the seminar tomorrow. Now, these engravings of calligraphy are one impressive corpus of physical remains that have come down to us from the northern Qi, testifying to the religious zeal of the period. And the other big corpus are stone sculptures, also amazing in numbers and quality. And as you know, in recent years, spectacular finds uh, were made in Qingzhou, Shandong, with hundreds of fragments of Buddhist uh, sculptures like those here, and the selection was here shown in an exhibition in London a couple of years ago, which you may have seen. And these uh, figures were probably smashed during the persecution, about uh, which I will talk in a minute. But um, having been preserved under the earth, these pieces, uh, is a polychrome paint on these pieces were still preserved, and this is very rare. But these fragments let us imagine how colorful 6th century sculptures must originally have looked like. Many are now in the museums of the world. <coughs> Yet the northern Qi dynasty was not going to last. Emperor Wu of the neighboring jo northern Zhou launched one of the most atrocious Buddhist persecution, first in 574 in his own realm, and then in the land of Qi, which he conquered, and the capital Ye of Qi fell on February 22nd, 577. And then it is said the emperor had 500 high clergymen assembled before his throne and declared his irrevocable will to eradicate their faith. The monks stood silently, the sources tell us, and tears in their eyes. Only one of them spoke up and warned the emperor that for his bad deeds, he would have to suffer in hell. We can imagine this one monk to have looked like this. <laughs> this is a figure in the Cleveland Museum of Art of the Northern Qi Dynasty of a monk. But the emperor did not care. He gave order to dissolve the monasteries, melt down the holy icons made of copper and gold, and turn them into coins, and burn the scriptures written on paper and silk. And his aim was to build up his military to a strength that might enable him eventually to conquer all of China and to reunite the empire. All monks were defrocked and pressed into military service, and the conquest of Qi to the east was the first big step in reuniting the empire. Yet, as the Buddhist sources tell us, there was a happy end for Buddhists. In little more than a year, the emperor was stricken by a malicious leprosy. No medicine could cure him. And within seven days, the 36-old monarch perished on June 21st, 578. Although his successor instantly reversed the most severe anti-Buddhist measures in the northern Zhou dynasty was doomed in 581. It was overpowered by the Sui dynasty and its emperor Wen was an artist Buddhist believer. He had the Buddhist establishment on his side, which 
probably helped him to reunite the empire, and in which he did in due course in 589, when he had conquered the Chen Dynasty in the south, uh, thereby getting reunification after three and a half centuries of division. But Emperor Wen was also a shrewd politician. This is his empire. I apologize for the very crude uh, maps, it's, uh, but you get an, it's just to give you an idea. As soon as Emperor Wen had come to the throne, he issued an edict obliging everyone in his realm to donate a small coin to the Buddha to mitigate the agonies of Emperor Wu of the Northern Zhou in hell. So Emperor Wen accomplished what in Europe the Western or Eastern Roman emperor, emperors and also all later emperors such as Charlemagne or Charles V or down to Napoleon failed to achieve, achieve that is political unity. And I'm not going to talk about Brexit now. <laughs> <laughs> but in addition to the help he had from Buddhism, uh, there were, of course, manifold other reasons why Emperor Wen of Sui succeeded with his reunification. Above the geography in the center of the Roman Empire was the Mediterranean Sea, which even although called Mare Nostrum, fostered political and cultural diversification. And the largest mountain chain of the continent, the Alps, were also run through the middle of the, of the Roman Empire. That was different in China with his vast, its vast coherent land mass and the Great Plains in the middle. But a major reason that the unification in China was successful in, and not in Europe was, I believe, that China writes differently. In Rome, <coughs> several systems of script existed side by side, Latin and Greek, but also somewhere still the hieroglyphs or, or northern Semitic scripts. And as the empire disintegrated, the Roman Empire, various new languages developed, gems in this rich and fascinating mosaic of European culture. They were written in phonetic scripts, mostly with Latin alphabet. But these writings, these literatures, could only be read and understood by someone who had first le learned that particular language. Not so in China. There was only one, a logographic script system. Its words could be read irrespective of their pronunciation, and that system underwent only little changes within 2,000 years. This is a fragment of a Confucian classical text written about 1900 years ago, and this is a Buddhist text written in 1093 AD in the famous Fangshan Depository uh, near Beijing, south of Beijing, more than 100 year, 900 years ago. And this here is a stone tablet written in 2001 on which the historic significance <coughs> of the valley with the engraved Diamond Sutra on Mount Tai, which we saw briefly, is explained. Here, the full arsenal of modern punctuation is used, periods, uh, commas, brackets, and Arab numbers, two types of brackets, and so on. But basically, <coughs> uh, well, and also used uh, here are the abbreviated characters which have been introduced into China since the 1950s, which and they differ, as you all know, from the old ones mainly in that the number of strokes is reduced. They differ orthographically, so to speak. But basically, that means lexically, these characters are the same as on the earlier stone tablets uh, which we saw 1800 years ago or 900 years ago. That means somebody who can read who can read this. And these, as we know, are more than a billion people. He can, after some practice, I have to admit, some practice is needed, but basically he can still read these two scripts up to 2,000 years ago. Uh, and this is not the case in Europe, as we all know. We cannot read texts which were written 2,000 years ago, and we cannot even 
read most of the texts which were written today if they were written uh, 200 kilometers away. I mean, <laughs> yes, unless you have learned the language. But and the literate Chinese can also read the people's daily. In this title, in cursive script up there, was written by Mao Zedong. And this is another example that shows how Chinese characters are imbued with a potency which transcends their utilitarian function as a graphic code. They are more than a graphic code. In the beginning, <laughs> we saw the woman praying in front of the character Buddha. The Buddha here is written, is uh, written and in, in the writing, in the ca written character, the Buddha is present in his name. This is, makes possible this personal rapport between the supplicant and him. And in the secular sphere, it is the writer himself who is present in his written, handwritten characters. Here it is Mao. With his handwriting, he guarantees the validity of everything that is ever printed in this newspaper. And he establishes a personal report between him and every reader. With his written characters, Mao fosters social coherence. The fact that China writes differently is a condition for its cultural, political, and social coherence. That coherence is unique in world history. It is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm.